today we're going to talk about independence, evoking the confidence to think creatively and divergently. Okay, this is Max Horkheimer, who was one of the founders of the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory. So he was a critical educator like me. Because this is just a snippet of a phrase that I really, really liked because I thought it encapsulated what one element of independence. So he says, each scholar has their own special form of spontaneity. I think that this is a really great way to think about independence, to begin starting to think about what it means to be an original, to be able to stand on your own. The way you can tell if you're being independent is what you do spontaneously. I think that nails it because that really gets to the heart of where independence begins. It begins in childhood, right? I mean, think about every parent ever. They can already tell that their child is unique and special. They can already tell that their child thinks in a different way than they do already. Spontaneity also implies action. Spontaneous is like a burst of something, right? It's uh, something you can't help. So you can't have spontaneity without action. And so that's what's exciting about cultivating an individual mind is that an individual mind, an independent thinker, will be able to act authentically. They will be able to act with originality. Only independent thinkers do we actually witness material acts of their creativity. Everybody's creative. Everyone is creative. But we don't always see everyone's creativity because it isn't manifesting in the material world. So only an independent thinker will engage in authentic action and be brave enough to be authentic, to be creative, to be independent, to stand out. It first starts with the mind. Spontaneity is also fun because when I think of spontaneity, I do think of children because they're so much better at it than we are. Not because they're better than us, but because they are more authentic. They are more true to their independent minds because they're more, <laughs> they haven't been socialized out of independence as much yet, right? And so we need to stop socializing us to all be the same and act the same and think the same. And kids, <laughs> naturally, each new generation uh, comes a curveball to that uh, tradition we have of trying to make everybody conform. Kids break the boxes all the time. And why do they do that? I'd argue because it's they have, there's a thin line between praxis and play for kids. So let's talk about what praxis is. This is a critical concept. Uh, it is a word that began with the Greeks, and many theorists have used it throughout time. I was first introduced to it with Paulo Freire, the critical educator who wrote the book Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And for Freire, praxis was action. Oh, I'm sorry. Action is a part of it, but let's begin with reflection plus action. When these two things are merged, when you are acting in an intentional way, when you've been reflective and your thoughts have are intentionally motivating your actions. If you're being uncritical, you're just acting without thinking. That's an uncritical approach to action. That's not praxis. Praxis is being considerate and attentive with our minds to our actions, thinking about consequences with our intention, thinking about what's important. So praxis is reflection, action, and then reflection again, right? You can't just think before you act. You also have to think after you act. How did that work? <laughs> what were those consequences? Uh, let me readjust and act again. This is what it means to be an intelligent species, to be constantly learning, if you're being critical, right? Because let's be honest, we're not always doing that, right? We're not always reflecting on our actions after we do them. Heck, we're not even always reflecting on our actions before we do them. This is a critical habit, becoming more skilled in your praxis means you're being more reflective with your actions. So praxis is intentional action. And play is also action. But how is it different from praxis? Because it is. I'd certainly say it is. And kids, they have such a thin line. Adults definitely separate out. Praxis is serious. We're intentionally acting. And it is serious. And play, like, how do adults even play? I know how adults play. But 
with praxis and play kids th these are completely overlapping maybe we should play have more fun and play more in other realms so that we can be more childlike and have more fun and not just leave play for the bedroom we should be more playful with our praxis too just like kids because i think they're more spontaneous and creative than us because they allow their praxis and their play to overlap so how is play different from praxis they're both action but play can be free from intention, right? Praxis cannot. You cannot engage in reflective action without intention. You have to have put your focus towards something and paid critical attentiveness to it in order to engage in praxis. But with play, that's what's fun about play is that you can let go. You don't have to be so engaged, right? One of the last times I played was at Christmas time, the holiday time, with my cousin George, we opened up his new Lego set. And I, for once, stopped thinking. <laughs> I realized I wasn't, I could let go of critical attentiveness. Because, yeah, it's really important to be intentional and essential and thinking about your consequences when it comes to real life. But that's the fun about play is that you can let go of that. And I let go of my mind and I was just playing with Legos. <laughs> and that was awesome. So that's one difference between praxis and play. Both are action, but play doesn't necessarily require intention. However, often <laughs> play does have intention, right? Make believe games that kids engage in reveals where their focus goes. Am I right? My little cousin George loves to play guns every time. And I'm like, let's play something else. <laughs> That's not my favorite. Maybe it's a wand instead, not a gun. Maybe it's a magic metal detector. Let's play those things. But his intention tends to go that way. And it reveals things about his context and his life and where his independent mind goes, right? We also, through play, we can have intention. But with that, it's free, not from intention, it's free from reality, right? All those games we were playing, those were free from reality. Praxis <laughs> cannot be free from reality. If I am intentionally acting, I need to be <laughs> intentionally acting in the real world. Unless you're an actor, of course. And that's why acting is probably fun. It's praxis and play mixed together in a really fun adult way. Look, we could do it outside sex. I'd say actors are engaging in that process of praxis and play. And look how they're able to be creative. That intersection is where creativity really flourishes, right? In some senses, they get a break from reality, right? And so they do their work in kind of a different real space. And that allows them to showcase their creativity, right? I feel like celebrities, we get to see a wide range of creativity that we don't always get to see in like our coworkers in the cubicles next to us. Yes, they're just as creative as any celebrities are, but because their actions are making them do the same thing every day, they're not, we're not getting to see and enjoy their creativity the same way. They're not getting that intersection between praxis and play. Actors shouldn't be the only ones able to engage in that independence. How can other jobs <laughs> and other positions that aren't performers begin to engage this intersection? I think that's an interesting question. So play, unlike praxis, can be free from intention. It can be free from reality. It can also be free from consequence, right? When you play, you can have a play game based in reality. You can have a play game where you're paying attention, where you're using your intention and focusing on the game and not mindlessly playing with Legos and letting yourself get lost. You can have your mind be part of play, have reality be part of play, but have play be free from consequence, right? I would say role play is one of those things. And now I'm not talking about the bedroom, but also, yes, it's other places too. So role play um, in the workplace, if you're figuring out what's appropriate and not appropriate for uh, interactions between the sexes, right? The consequences would be different, right? If we show an example of what not to do, it's not gonna cause the same harm because it's the consequences aren't there, right? It's based in reality, we're being intentional, but the consequences aren't there. And so that play gives us room to educate in a different way, right? When the consequences are real, <laughs> and it's made a real impact, yes, we can still learn from it, but the consequences have been made and they've been made in a real way with praxis, not with play. So anyway, this 
intersection between practice and play where spontaneity and creativity can really, really thrive and where authentic action can really be cultivated, I think is a really interesting space that we should be exploring as humans. How can we, instead of like adults do, separating out praxis and play and only leaving play for the bedroom. I think that's really repressing us, you guys. <laughs> we should be playing more and then it wouldn't be so bottled up and we wouldn't be so crazed <laughs> and we'd be more creative and we'd have more fun and uh, we'd be more childlike. We'd get to experience our own originality, our own spontaneity. What are those things that you just long to do, right? Spontaneity is independence. And so how do we cultivate spontaneous thinking where everyone can just act instinctually how they would react to things, right? Instead of creating all these filters of the appropriate way to act and the appropriate way to think, and you should only think about these things and these boundaries. No, no, no. We want to let people go where their spontaneity takes them, where their instincts just automatically lead them in their thought. Because most of the time, what we spontaneously want is humanizing, right? It's gonna uplift us in the world. It's not doing any harm. I'd say most of what we desire doesn't wanna cause harm. And if what you desire spontaneously does cause harm, we're not engaging in those. That's I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about humanizing spontaneous acts that are instinctual and creative that toddlers do and kids do, where they just authentically act without even thinking about it because that's just who they are. Uh, I think that channel of being independent in your mind and acting with that independence, we block that. That's one of those channels that we block. Socializing kids to be kind to one another, that's an important socialization, right? Not harming one another, Yes, we should all be on the same page about that. We all agree to, hey, I'm not gonna hurt you on purpose. I'm not gonna hurt anyone else on purpose. I'm gonna do everything in my power not to choose a harmful consequence. That is not conformity. <laughs> that is humanizing. That's a humanizing agreement and a humanizing arrangement. That's not blocking any independence. We socialize too much in conforming other types of behavior. Uh, other types of social behavior, that this is the only acceptable way to act, this is the only acceptable way to be, that begins to block the channel between independent mind and independent authentic action. And that's, we all have that blocked. We've all, because our schools and our communities haven't put a lot of stress on being independent thinkers, being creative, being divergent, thinking differently, because if you're spontaneous, you're harder to control. Children are harder to control. <laughs> they are more spontaneous. And so what our work needs to be is how do we cultivate a society of independent thinkers, of original actors, of spontaneous beers who are just spontaneously being in the world and engaging in their instinctual actions that are humanizing. How do we create a society that isn't complete chaos? We can absolutely do it. That's every kindergarten class ever. <laughs>